So Maria, can you see my slides? I can, they look great and I can see you and speak of ah, you. Brilliant, okay. thank you very much. Okay, well, You're welcome. Um, I will get started then. Thank you very much, Maria and everyone um, for inviting us to come and visit, um, sorry, to present tonight um, the biodiversity net gain in the context of um, Sutton. So um, just to give you uh, an idea, this will be um, the first part is just an overview really of um, biodiversity net gain for those of you who are less familiar with the, um, the approach. Um, and then the, the sort of main focus of the presentation, which I think a lot of you are here tonight to listen to is obviously our experience of delivering biodiversity net gain in the context of a local borough in London, so Sutton. Um, and, um, you know, it's a, it's a great opportunity really with the context of where we find ourselves you know, a year year uh, to go before, um, you know, the Environment Act becomes mandatory through the planning process and we're going to have to be delivering net gain. So, you know, for, for some of you who are in local authorities, that's obviously, you know, you know critical to understand what to do um, for ecologists who are going to be, you know, delivering this work. And then, you know, e you know even for people who are just, you know, um, in the public, um, you know, it's, it can be quite scary or, you know, you might just be really interested to know how is this going to be delivered. Um, so um, you might see some of the pages are hyperlinked. Um, so when we share this presentation, there's an opportunity to, 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 to link to some of the information that's on our website to make it a bit easier for that too. So I will start. Um, so what is, by the, oh, sorry. So what is biodiversity net gain? Can you see that second slide? Yeah, that's fine. Great. So what is biodiversity net gain? So it's really the first time the complexity of nature has been boiled down into a, a couple of numbers. I mean, a lot of numbers really, but um, by using a metric, we're able to measure biodiversity and its complexity in, in a way that can be, um, to be shared, can be measured and can be understood by, by lots of other people, not just us ecologists. Um, and I think importantly, it's comparable, but also dis defensible in the context of planning. And that's really important because, you know, planning is all about the detail um, and being precise. So, you know, it's really helpful to have something as precise as a metric to sort of, you know, reinforce our, um, our arguments. But how does a metric measure biodiversity and how does it do it just by uh, assessing habitats? So the metric um, uses, oh, sorry, the metric uses a term called distinctiveness. Uh, and that's a value to, um, to assess different types of habitats. In this case, it's a species rich grassland um, and it's of higher distinctiveness than say the amenity grassland um, which is of lower distinctiveness, and that's for obvious reasons. You know, um, the, the species rich grassland is ecologically diverse, lots of flowers, more pollination, more variety of flowering times, there's lots of eco niches compared to the immunity grassland that's very species poor um, and hasn't got that variety. And similarly, in an ancient woodland, it would have a similar situation high distinctiveness, lots of different layers rather than a plantation woodland that is just a single species and very young. So it's the maturity as well that's quite key. And all these um, definitions or these high and low is all valued in numbers. So high could be, you know, four, low could be two, you know, and it's all valued in, um, in a mathematical calculation. So the other thing that the metric has is um, a thing called condition. And that's to do with the habitat condition. So it's very strongly linked to management um, and the presence of invasive species and the effects of disturbance. So in this case for this pond, we know that ponds are high value for biodiversity. Lots and lots of species depend on them, but its condition is perhaps not so great because um, you can see there's some algae um, that has formed on the surface. And that shows that there's um, a lot of eutrophication um, because it's close to roads. So the condition of this habitat is say medium. So high distinctiveness, medium condition, and these get tallied up in the calculation. 
And when thinking about a site in terms of what constitutes habitat, it is absolutely everything. It's 100% of the site and it's very important to capture everything. So that's buildings, walls, hard standings, fences, you know, and all the traditional you know, um, types of habitats that we would say, you know, grassland, woodland, but there's lots of different types. Um, and this is where, you know, a good map is, you know, critically important and, you know, spatial mapping like um, geographical information system, again, critical and, and a really useful tool in this process. And you can kind of see how it can get super complicated, you know, big sites or urban sites with lots of um, small detailed uh, habitats all makes this quite um, a big undertaking really and you can get you know 10 15 20 different habitats all on one site and then there are linear and river river habitats and these are calculators as well but they usually assess separately so i wanted to go into the calculation and i've split it into three parts so it can be kind of understood more clearly the key thing to understand is the first bit looks super simple, but it actually is quite hard to get right. And that's because everything is underpinned by it. And everyone in the room, the, co the ecologist, the landscape architect, the, the, the person that's done the typology mapping, you know, they, it, they all have to agree. So it has to be, you know, accurate and, and agreed by everyone. So, for example, depending on the habitats present, there may be opportunities for a variety of activities. So you might want to retain some high distinctiveness habitats. You might want to enhance habitats that are in poor condition. And you may want to remove others of low quality um, to create new higher quality ones. So if anything goes wrong, then it has a real knock on effect and, and things can go wrong and it can take a lot of time and it can cause a lot of trouble later on. So the second part is um, a little bit more complicated to look at, um, but actually there is a little bit of movement because, um, because it's a prediction, um, it will be updated as you go through the planning process. So whilst it's um, indicative um, pre-planning, it will become uh, more definitive uh, in detailed design stage. Um, as it's only a prediction, we don't know you know, there's a few more, you know, uncertainties about it. So the calculator requires two additional um, features to be calculated and, and kind of included in the, in the assessment. And that is a difficulty to create the habitat and a time to target, the, time to target condition. Um, and to get this right, um, because you're talking about a future prediction of a development site, it actually requires someone else to be involved. And it's not just the ecologist that can do this assessment. It has to include the landscape architect and it has to include the, the, the client and you know, the potential idea of who's going to be on site because all those elements will influence what habitats are possible and what management is possible and what condition is possible. So, it's, so that element is really tricky to get right. And it requires a lot of collaboration and, and, and understanding between different professions. And it's really important because, for example, what an ecologist understands as enhanced may actually be very different to what a landscape architect defines as being enhanced. And it's just simple things like that can really uh, throw a spanner in the works. So the final part of the calculation looks simple too, but it's confusing because of the way the results can be expressed. Um, so for being for a biodiversity, sorry, for, for biodiversity net gain to happen, it's a prediction. So, you know, in 20 years time, it might be biodiversity net gain, but it's not now. Um, and so it depends a bit on the habitats that have been proposed. Um, measuring in biodiversity units is far better because it's more uh, measured. As I said, it's, it's, it's to do with the calculation and it's to do with the, the methodology, but a percentage is really relative. So take this example, you know, a hard standing, uh, you throw a few lavender bushes um, and you get a net gain. It can be really tokenistic and, and, and quite frustrating. And so it's very difficult um, to understand, you know, what the value is when, when people talk in percentages. But likewise, when developers boast they have reached 200% net gain in London, and I've, and I've worked on those sites, they, they, they look amazing. Um, but that's because they're large sites, currently just a car park, 
and the master, look, master plan looks amazing. But we know um, to deliver that in detailed design is much, much harder. So um, the good thing is numbers don't override meaning. Um, and it's really good to see um, that the professional institutes and DEFRA go into a lot of detail. I mean, a lot of detail about um, all of the sort of small, the small words um, around actually how to deliver and, and implement biodiversity net gain in practice. Um, and this is not an exhaustive list and there's a lot more on those links as well. Um, this is really important because obviously as ecologists, we really understand that we, we're sensitive to the complexities of nature and, and how things can vary depending on scale and, and, and all sorts of things. But that's with experience. But obviously with someone with less knowledge, it's very easy to, to not understand this and get lost and get confused and, and make interpretations that are not correct. And there's a few other things to, to, pick, to take note on. So, you know, it's additional to existing legislation and protection that we have. So these guys aren't included. However, you know, the, the net gain, whilst it's focusing on um, habitats as a proxy, it does recognize in the small print again, that local species must be considered in the context of any net gain project. So it's there, but it's, it's hidden, it's hidden in the words. Again, um, you know, ancient woodland and blanket bogs are not considered as part of the net gain assessment because they're irreplaceable. They're so valuable that there's nothing that we can do about that. But obviously they require bespoke consideration where they, they, are, they are needed to be affected. And then last but not least, uh, connectivity is currently not included um, in the metric, but that's more from a technical perspective it's just really hard to understand how to measure it using a maths uh, um, and numbers. And last, in, last but not least, in this section, you know, where do the gains go? So, you know, obviously on site where possible, um, because this follows the mitigation hierarchy and has the highest social benefit. Um, but off site, um, it may be necessary in some situations and may not be so bad. Um, it might have some ecological benefits, particularly if it's linked to a biodiversity strategy. And this is obviously something we'll talk about in more detail in the next section. And then um, last and definitely least is the statutory credits option, which is um, something that DEFRA are trying to work out how to do at the moment, um, which is about paying a one-off payment for for delivering the offset of some kind somewhere in England, um, which has some huge concerns um, for us at the moment. So that is the end of the first section, you'd be glad to know. <laughs> um, so we now move on to the, the main part of our presentation, which is about um, the, the London Borough of Sutton, obviously. <laughs> um, and I just thought it was worth just um, drawing your attention to, to the Borough of Sutton because um, um, it might be very new to some of you. And, um, and it was new to me um, this time, well, in January, um, early on this year. So um, Sutton is of quite an urban um, borough, um, particularly it is an outer uh, London borough, but it's pretty urban, pretty small. Um, it has a small proportion of green belt in the south, southern half of the borough where um, it, um, it touches on the North Downs chalk, uh, chalk bridge. Um, so there's some really uh, lovely chalk grassland in places like Roundshaw Downs, Oaks Park and Cunnington Meadows. Um, it has a very high percentage of garden land. Uh, the majority of um, those roads are all kind of, um, you know, classic terrace housing. Um, um, and, some, and some massive gardens um, to the south of the borough. It has a section of the River Wandle, which is a really important strategic green, green corridor um, within the borough. And it's um, very close to Bennington Farmlands, which is a sort of strategic scale restoration project on um, a landfill and Thames Water site. Um, so that sort of gives you a flavour of, of what Sutton is like, and I definitely think it influences how our, well, so Sutton's approach to the biodiversity net gain, um, uh, you know, how it's developed because of the nature of the borough, and it might not be right for your borough, and I think it's probably worth pointing out here, it's not a definitive way, it's the way that's happened here, it's an, it's an, it's a, it's an approach, but it might, um, 
it might not be definitive, well, it's definitely not definitive, but anyway, um, uh, it would be great to get your feedback and thoughts at the end of the session. Um, and it's certainly some, it's certainly um, how we feel that um, it's an approach that we can really deliver the Lawton principles, um, which are bigger, better, more joined up um, through the, the principles of a, of a biodiversity net gain um, approach uh, to planning. So, um, yes, that's the point. Um, I've, I've phrased the next couple of slides as questions because I sort of feel that that might be quite a good way to, to help answer some of the questions you might have and, and focus the, the information. So it's sort of, you know, I think meaningful for, for some of the people on this call. So how do you, how do you, how does biodiversity net gain get triggered? So, well, it starts with a local plan. Um, you know, there's there's a few words in the local plan which which really are important. So it, it references the need for an, an a biodiversity accounting, which which is which was what what we had in those days. Um, but obviously, an accounting with some kind of metric. Um, and then, as a result of those words, there was you know um, there was an iterative process of. Um, needing documents to explain what that meant and how to deliver it and what do uh, developers need to provide us. So the process has been sort of ongoing uh, and as we've ongoing, been ongoing, there's been more detail that's been required. And just to say that all these documents um, are useful and important for ecologists and developers to read, but there's probably still some improvement to do. And there's likely to be an SPD next year to, to sort of bring a lot of this information into one document. But that's how um, it's happened because we started such an, uh, such an early stage um, and it's a sort of um, learning process as we've gone along. The other way that a biodiversity net gain is triggered is dependent on the um, development type. So household applications are not, in, not involved because they're too small um, and there's unlikely to be a huge amount of uh, vegetation loss. For minor and change of use, um, it's anything, any development that will affect a greater than 100 meters of vegetation. And that's because um, we get a lot of um, infill developments, um, you know, which affect back garden land. So this is a way of capturing any development that's likely to, to have a, a negative impact. And it's that, that sort of classic case of, you know, death by a thousand cuts. You know, we would lose a lot of land very quickly if we didn't capture the minor developments that are doing that. Um, and there's policies that we have that, that protect garden land if it has an ecological connectivity value, when this is, this is also um, uh, a sort of an extra sort of um, way of, of, of capturing, you know, the risk of, of that sort of thing happening. And then obviously major developments, definitely because there's a huge potential to deliver uh, massive enhancements in places like Sutton that are so gray and need so much help to, 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 for enhancements. But also if there's any significant impacts, then obviously we'd like to capture that and make sure they, they get retained and enhanced as part of the development. So there's a sort of a, a, a double um, benefit um, with, with doing it for major developments. So what information do we need? Well, you know, aside from the calculation itself, which is obviously new for everyone, you know, there's a there's obviously a skills gap. There's there's a lot of learning to do. There's a lot of, you know, getting used to the typologies, the the you know, the different um, you know, conditions and distinctiveness and how it all works, obviously. Um, but other other than that, we don't really ask for anything that would not normally be asked for. Um, you know, GIS maps, you know are pretty standard, you know, you know, accurate and, and measured, you know, that's standard stuff. And we, we don't, ex uh, we don't, you, you don't have to use UK HAB, you know, we still accept phase one habitat surveys because, you know, that's what everyone is used to and UK HAB is still new and there's still, you know, some issues with that. Um, but we are still finding a lot of inconsistencies and that's, uh, you know, that, get, that takes a lot of our time up. So I thought it was worth just highlighting some of those issues, um, you know, because it, it's just it's just worth knowing that, um, 
you know, I mean, I've been in a consultant before um, and I know what it's like, you know, ecology reports are done in isolation, the scope is super narrow, there's no time to do anything else, you know, and it's all about protected species and all about liability. But I think with BNG, it, you know, it's really critical to kind of think a little bit outside of that scope and, and try and, you know, cr create a scope that's, that is able to look a little bit further out and to think about those local species and that local habitat, even if it's not protected, you know, properly, you know, super protected, you know, it's about valuing, you know, that local context. Um, and, and I think that's really important. And, and also to, 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 to work with your landscape design colleagues, not to marry them, but to, to marry with the landscape and design and what they're doing and, and the urban greening information. So that's really key as well. So how do we ensure um, biodiversity net gain is delivered on site? Well, it's it's really all about these very stringent planning conditions. And that's obviously been a quite an iterative process um, because as we've we've found that more details needed to get um, you know get get what we want on site. And this makes it super clear to developers what is expected and ensure what is delivered is has the best outcomes for biodiversity. So for a BEMP um, biodiversity uh, enhancement management plan, that is required pre-commencement uh, and sets out the details of what is, needs to be delivered um, in terms of habitats and for what species. Um, the updated biodiversity net gain is critical because we know that, you know, from master plan to detailed design, everything can go out, out, out out the, the room, <laughs> you know, that, you know, things can change radically. So it's really important that the design still delivers a net gain. So that's critical. Um, and the statement of conformity, um, that's um, post completion, um, which is about evidencing the habitats and features that have been installed to ensure they are correctly installed. And how are we monitoring? And that's really critical as well, um, because you know, to make meaningful biodiversity net gain, you have to make sure that, that the habitats have been monitored. So, so here the, the monitoring reports have been front loaded um, and that's been, that, it looks onerous, but it's really critical to make sure that development is really thinking carefully about how it's managing its habitats on site. You know, if you don't get it right early on, it won't work. So that's why it's, it's really front loaded. Um, and also critically, um, to ensure compliance because we know that a breach of condition is not onerous enough the section 106 agreement is critical to make sure that um, the owner if they don't deliver on the net gain and they don't deliver their their the habitats they uh, being they said they would they'll be liable and liable in terms of a legal liability um, so that's really key And do we think that um, this is too onerous for these sorts of sites? And do we think that these, this sort of um, uh, approach delivers on the Lawton principles? So what happens if there is a net loss? And a net loss is the only way. Well, it's if the developer believes there's no other way of delivering the net gain on site, then there is the the basis of a biodiversity tariff and the biodiversity tariff enables the payment to deliver the remaining units off site. It basically makes the plan, the application or the development um, lawful in the context of planning. So it's good for that reason. And in Sutton, we price biodiversity very highly. So the cost of a unit of woodland is illustrated in the red box. So nearly 300,000 pounds. Um, now, this is full cost recovery in action. You know, it's London after all, right? But what it means is it's taking, um, it, it, what, it takes, it, what it takes to pay to deliver a habitat for 30 years per hectare is that much. It, you know, it's about cap, um, capturing everything, you know, and it's not like um, it might be in, in, the, in the rural areas where farmers might do the work. This is work that will be done by sub contract is more likely and that's why it costs uh, a lot more so in, but in Sutton we're you know as as the map showed you know we're only going to be talking about tiny fragments of a hectare so it's never going to be that much um, you know but it might be five thousand it might be ten thousand pounds or thirty thousand pounds 
but it gives the smaller developer an option if they don't think it's achievable on site to go for this option just to pay and for the 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 the, um, the habitat to be delivered off site but at the same time for a big developer it may get them to rethink their design and that's that's a good thing um, and when we and what this does mean then is the monies can then be delivered can go to to deliver high quality habitat where it can be delivered at scale and managed in perpetuity um, by the borough. And Southern is in a unique position because they manage all their biodiversity sites outside of the, um, the, the, um, the parks department and how they, they manage their, their parks. So it is a unique position that they're in, but that's, that's been um, uh, a really effective approach. And we do have some offsetting sites as a result of um, the Section 106 monies that have come from small developments that have not been able to deliver the small amounts of um, net gain on site. And they, they've been taken to, um, uh, in this example, Bedington Parklands, um, where the different uh, colours represent different types of habitats that are uh, planned to be delivered um, you know, over the next couple of years. So we've got new hedgerows plans, species rich meadows, wood pasture and river restoration on the, on the Wandle. So um, th this is a, you know, sort of the ground, the ground up kind of approach, um, um, focusing on where we've got the most influence with, with land that we manage or land that our colleagues manage directly in parks um, to get habitat offsetting, habitat banking embedded into um, park management plans and then we can, you know, develop um, the, the strategy further as things become more formalised next year. So what now? So just a few things really to summarise before um, we break for questions. Um, we're obviously concerned about the statutory credit and, the con and conscious to work closely with our neighbours to ensure that the offset costs are not undermined and Sutton doesn't lose out doesn't lose out on habitat but also doesn't lose out on the monies that we need to deliver you know the Lawton principles and, and and make Sutton better for its um, residents but also the consistency um, would be great you know to have to have you know a consistency across boroughs because that will help consultants and that will help developers uh, you know otherwise you're looking at 33 different options of how you're going to deliver net gain and that would be you know, quite complicated. Um, and there's also, uh, there's also obviously a need for the government to, to recognise that 10% is just meaningless and a little bit, um, you, know, you know, uninspiring. And then actually we need something that's a lot more bespoke, potentially something that might link to design codes or character areas. And I'd like to stop there and thank you for listening and any questions? Thank you very much, Rosie. Do you want to stop sharing your screen now? Yeah, that's great. And then we can kind of see people when they ask questions as well. That was really helpful. Because that gave you a, it was a good overview of the kind of the broader situation and then really useful kind of then honing in on Sutton and kind of what's been going on there. So it's really interesting. I did want to just pick up on something and then we'll kind of go to other people's questions as well. You, you kind of just mentioned near the end about London boroughs working in a kind of consistent way and collaborating and perhaps having a more of a shared approach. Is that something that there are kind of, you know, is that starting to happen? Something that there are plans for, for that to happen? How, how do you kind of see that moving forward? Yeah, I mean, uh, absolutely. So, I mean, we're, we're, we're regularly in talks with, with um, other local authority or local boroughs. Um, I mean, there's regular meetings where we all join up and talk um, like on a monthly basis. Um, and also, you know, we, we've got regular talks, talks where we actually meet in the individual boroughs themselves and actually going through in a sort of a lot deeper conversation um, around actually what how it might work and, and what needs to be done and, and what people, um, what they can learn from us. Um, uh, you know, and, and the approach, because uh, I think there is there is some difference, you know, that different different boroughs might take a slightly different um, angle because their boroughs are different and they have different issues. But yes, in terms of um, other consistencies, yes, we're, we're trying to work where we can across all of the boroughs. 
Thanks. So what we're going to do now, as Kieran said, if you people want to put their videos on, that's great. Um, and obviously, if you're going to ask questions and things, it's nice if we can kind of see you. There's there was a couple of questions already um, in the chat. Um, Sivvy, you've asked a couple of really interesting things. I don't know if you'd like to um, sort of unmute yourself and put those questions in person. Um, do 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 that if you'd like to. Otherwise, we're happy to kind of read them out as well. Sure, sorry. Um, yes, it was just two questions. The first one was based on the point you made about involving landscape architects, which I do agree with. But there is that, you know, when you said about how you judge what is improvement, how much are landscape architects being, well, or having that message reinforced that it has to be based on the ecology rather than some sort of greening they've done when the ecology is challenged because sometimes the schemes look quite green or you know they put these schemes forward in planning and it doesn't always a at the moment I know it's not you know legal but it doesn't always come out that way at the other end and the species used etc you know there's a, always a high percentage of you know non-native species they need the winter interest the architectural interest so how do we get that message across because I don't know if it's there yet Yes, a really good question. Um, and I think the problem is, is that ecologists are not involved soon enough. You know, that it's, you know, I think, I think, oh, well, I th you know, so biodiversity net gain for an ecologist, I don't think it's changed very much. I think you still do everything the same way. You're still involved in the EIA and, and you just, and it's like, it's just like another thing you have to do. That That's my understanding. Or my, but, but actually, we really need more ecologists to to start working in the design teams, um, and that's much further up. That strategic ecology is what uh, we used to call it. You know, it's about it's about you know seeing ecology as as a much more integrated aspect of design. And I and I think the landscape architects are lost, to be honest, um, in in the nicest possible way, because I'm kind of partly involved in that landscape world. Um, you know that actually they need ecologists, high, you know, to help with them in the design. Um, but because you're, you know, so focused on ecology and, and and surveying bats and making sure all of the protected species stuff is sorted, that you know they don't have anyone else to help them. And you know, you know, for the best will in the world, those phase one, uh, those those phase one reports are so dry. How are they? How are you supposed to understand that if you're not an ecologist? So I, I think there just needs to be a little bit more of, um, you know um a chance to to work with them more closely and 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 get up there and help them and and, and work closer in the design design stage thanks rosie i'm going to just bring in um david warburton as well um because he, obviously it will be interesting to kind of get his perspective so did you have any thoughts on that as well david yeah i mean I, I, again i think you know as rosie says it's a really kind of good point and and the, the main issue is that there's a, a significant disconnect between what landscape architects want and what ecologists want. So, so in terms of the metric, what happens is that the ecologists, if they do a, a PEA or a, an ECIA and put to and, and actually do the biodiversity net gain assessment up front, which is quite rare in our experience unless we actually force them to do so because they've not read our policies. Um, then they come out with like an indicative figure and that's what goes at planning determination. So are they likely to deliver a net gain? Are they likely to deliver a net loss? And then how do we deal with that? So, and which Rosie has kind of dealt with. The issue is that when we come, come to the kind of detailed design phase, i.e. discharge of condition, the landscape architects puts in what they want to put in and that doesn't marry up with the kind of ambitions from the PEA, ECIA, whatever may have been submitted initially. So we go, right, we want a biodiversity enhancement management plan and to rerun a biodiversity net gain assessment at pre-commencement. So you've given us an indicative net gain, net loss, whatever it is. You need to do detailed design because nobody wants to pay for that upfront. So, OK, off you go. And we choose, you know, effectively you have a pathway I do deliver a net gain, do you deliver a net loss? And in which case we'll try and capture both of those via section 106. The, so, so the landscape architects do all the things that 
that that we've said you know they kind of want to put seasonal interest in even you know oh, oh stuff that's that's green over winter even though we're in a temperate climate and it's not really kind of what we want um and and so it's a it's a matter for us as local authorities to go well how does that manage with the conditions that we've written into so so we have in our biodiversity strategy a little bit about soft landscaping and you know information from the plants for bugs pro uh, project for RHS, the um, oh I can't remember the the, the acronym, but the, the the kind of study in Sheffield that went on that was talking about you know what we really need in terms of kind of garden lands. So we reference that in the biodiversity strategy and say uh, effectively we want at least sixty percent native local species that are appropriate for that habitat type. So if it's a biodiverse roof, whether it, if it's a woodland, if it's a if it's a grassland that's kind of where we have to kind of be um and then 40 percent ornamental kind of you know landscape architect interest should be on something like the rhs plants for pollinators lists all of known kind of wildlife value so so that's how we try to capture that but obviously 60 percent is just an an arbitrary figure that i've tried to put in to, to make it you know skew for natives so if people want to put in a uh, claim a semi-improved uh, neutral grassland in good condition and their species mix has 40% non-natives well that's not passing muster that's not going to deliver the habitat type that we want so so the kind of soft landscaping is really about where can we concentrate native species in habitats that we really want and where can we allow grace to you know human interest architectural desire for you know introduce shrubs or you know kind of cottage garden borders or rockeries or you know planters and all that kind of thing so it's trying to provide a balance where we try and fit as much as kind of beneficial stuff in in as possible really so that was quite a long <laughs> long response i'm not sure if that's that's kind of answered it fully uh hopefully it, it has um uh predicting about the post development side yeah so so effectively did the, the the landscape architect the ecologist all of that needs to marry up things like uh in Sutton we have the green space factor which we adopted before um the the london plan urban green factor but all that has to marry up as well so it's about looking at all of these these issues that that potentially define habitat areas and we may go well actually in your biodiversity net gain assessment you said the site is exactly 9,001 square meters, for instance, but your urban green factor says it's 8,006 square meters. So where is that, where's that discrepancy? And, and obviously the two don't quite mesh, but you know, we have to ask these questions and, and quite forensic detail at, at times to really kind of, well, what have they put into the calculator? How has that worked? Have they really kind of thought about where they're going to, to deliver these? Is it realistic? Is it reasonable? Is it proportionate? So. Um, Yes, so sorry, sorry, that was the first one. Um, so, bum, 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 bum. And biodiversity tariff, who sets it? Uh, someone's a lot better setting. Right, okay. So I set it. Um, so as Rosie says, this is a, a full cost recovery mechanism. So uh, effectively, and I stole everything from, from Dave Lowe in Warwickshire because they were part of the 2012 DEFRA 1.0 pilot. They were the only ones that mandated it. They then had, you know, eight to 10 years uh, of, of mm -hmm, well, sorry, not quite so much before I started stealing stuff, but yeah, they, they at least had a, a kind of working program. Um, so everything that Sutton has done is effectively kind of based on Warwickshire and then tweaked mm -hmm. to make it more applicable to less than a sub-region, but to a very, you know, urban uh, London mm -hmm. borough. So the calculator is 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 based on theirs, but I've split out things like um, green infrastructure into things that that were much more likely to to have in in Sutton rather than the Warwickshire uh, subregion. Um, the costs that that Dave Lowe in, in Warwickshire came out with very sensibly were based on kind of national figures, um, and mainly based on things like high level stewardship. Um, which says that you will be paid as a landowner 
I think it's something like £1,486 per hectare to create a new woodland. For me, that isn't anywhere near enough because if I create a new woodland at that kind of cost and then I need to manage it and monitor it and do everything else that I need to do for 30 years, it's nowhere near full cost recovery. If I want to create a functional woodland within the timescales of BNG, i.e. 30 years, I will be planting some heavy standards. I may be planting some light feathered standards. I'll plant some whips, but I want some kind of gradation. I want structure, I want edge habitat as well. So I want to create some meadows, maybe some pathways, whatever I kind of need to do. So how much does that cost in terms of how much is a standard and how many are we going to plant per hectare? How much is wildflower seed per hectare? How much is the kind of contract of management necessary to, to do this? Because, you know, I don't have capacity within my tiny little team. And we have a team in Sutton, which is amazing for, for London, but, you know, we still don't have, have enough. Um, so I need to pay a contractor to, to go and do this. Or maybe I need to pay a contractor to turf strip to create a grassland and how much does that cost per hectare if i want to graze a grassland how much does that cost per hectare how much is the fencing how much is the water trough and all of these are built in to my calculation that's full cost recovery to me because if i don't put those in at day one and i go well actually you can have you know one hectare of grassland for five thousand pounds two years down the line i'm going well we don't have enough money who's paying for this it has to be the council so I have to protect the council's interest by charging at full cost recovery, even if I may not use all of those aspects. So even if there's a grassland that I may not ever graze, I have to consider how much that, that may cost, because otherwise I'm at risk of subsidising developers. And that's not really the aim of, of, of you know, biodiversity net gain. So you know, I've taken a very kind of bespoke approach um, and uh, the, the, the issue is that we will be subsumed within mandatory biodiversity net gain next year, and we'll have to follow. Now, they've said they're getting rid of kind of biodiversity tariffs. They, we don't have a general tariff. Everything's going to be market-led. I, if you need to offset, you go to the market and you buy your units. Now, for me, that doesn't work because I have a plan of what I want to happen in Sutton. So that means effectively I've got to try and monopolize that market. And that's really kind of where, where, where Rosie comes in uh, and, and what we're working on over the next year or so to really try and get that market monopoly to say that actually, if you want to deliver habitats in Sutton, it's going to cost you this much to do this biodiversity offsetting, which is where we want you to do it, whether it's river restoration, whether it's creating new meadows in parks whether it's you know new woodlands whatever it is that we kind of want which is set out by the biodiversity strategy so we've kind of got those policy drivers to, to force if you will developers to do what we want to do once it goes to an open market this is the risk that we face that we may be undercut because joe blogs a farmer two miles down the road in surrey may be able to create a woodland for a lot less than I can create it because he's got all the machinery he's got you know he doesn't have to do deal with all the kind of enforcement and the planning aspects of it he just goes right I'm going to create a woodland I've got all the machinery bosh off we go 10 grand and I go well even even if because there's a strategic risk multiplier even so that may still be a lot cheaper than I can deliver it for because I've got to pay for contractors I've got to do all the enforcement i've got to do all the planning i've got to do all the monitoring all that kind of stuff so it for me for me it has to be bespoke to each bono as to how they will deliver effectively what will come into the uh, the biodiversity gain sites register from next year so all the stuff that we've kind of mapped out which rosie gave you an indication of will go into that register and i think we'll have to cost it to go right if you're going to create or pay for an offset in this area you need to pay x amount which will be related to the biodiversity units that we can deliver for, for a net gain for that area 
Okay, sorry, <laughs> really massive kind of uh, answers there. So I'm sorry about that. Um, no, that's really helpful because I, I think you're kind of you know really giving us a good picture about how things are working and also thinking about you know what's going to happen next and how you're going to kind of manage and deal with that. So if, I, I'm sure I'm sure it's uh, that was kind of of general interest, but yeah, very thoroughly answered Sylvie's questions as well. I'm going to go now to Kieran because you've had your hand up for a while, and I know they've also got some comments and things coming through in the chat, which I'll pick up afterwards. So over to you first, Kieran. Yeah, my question goes a little bit beyond Sutton, basically. So Sutton are obviously ahead of the game with this. You guys are. You've been very proactive with it and you're working it for biodiversity as a local authority, which is great. And, and that's what biodiversity net gain should be. A lot of people are worried that biodiversity net gain is exactly what you've alluded to. It could be a marketplace to, to sell off biodiversity and subsidise developers and, and be detrimental to biodiversity in general. So my question is, considering every single London borough is different in its structure etc what do you think makes what do you think each london borough needs in terms of for example positions policy etc to make sure that they don't become of one, one of the naughty boroughs that is destroying everything in the name of biodiversity in that game shall i say this rosie Booker. <laughs> um so i i mean i mean starting from kind of first principles you know i have never ever wanted to commodify nature you know it, it's it's you know I've, I've been a conservationist for a long time honestly be wild just sutton whatever you know it's not what i want to do the reason that i kind of pushed it for our local planet is because we know that that the current situation is not working the agri-environment schemes are not delivering except in very kind of targeted ways for you know soil bunting in dorset or, or devon or whatever um so so ultimately who is going to pay for a nature rich world and it's not the government and we're, we you know we're quite certain on that and particularly i mean I, I was certain on that you know seven years ago given where we are now okay let, let's brush over that one so so the local authority can't fund it. Our our funding is 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 slashed. Um, you know, so we have to generate money from business rates, um, uh, what's the term? Uh, stuff for people. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, what what the hell is it called, Rosie? Somebody help me out. What do we charge residents? Council tax. Council tax. Thank you. Crikey. Sorry. Sorry. Um, yeah, so, so, so effectively, council income comes from council tax, business rates and government grants. And government grants have been slashed uh, over the years, as they have for, you know, the EA, DEFRA, any. So who's going to pay for this? And, and the only way for me is that we can force developers to pay for it, which means commodify nature, which means we have to sell off bits of nature to generate better bits of nature. And this is the massive risk. So, so I think to come back to your, your question, Kieran, every London borough, every local planning authority in the country needs an ecologist in-house. That it's, I think that is rule number one. Somebody needs to be able to look at this with a critical eye and go, that is not correct. Because if you submit a, a you know, DEFRA 3.1 to a, a, a case officer for planning, are they experienced and critical enough, given everything else that they have to deal with, going to look at that and go, that says 10%, 12%, 14% uplift, tick, off we go. Or are they going to look at it and go, actually, that's a load of old nonsense because the landscaping designs, the UGF, don't add up. They're not considering you know, time to condition. They're not considering risk assessments. They're not condition, uh, considering uh, edaphic and, and geological factors and not condition you know considering how this is going to be managed in the long term who's going to do it all those kind of things they will see a box that says green 10 percent or above tick off we go given that something in the region of only one third of of um, english planning authorities have an in-house ecologist this is a massive risk it's a huge risk 
and it's something that the government has to fund centrally, centrally if we are actually going to deliver the 25 year environment plan and leave the environment in a better state than we found it there's no other way other than investing in people and skills to be able to to look at this the flip side is that obviously ecological consultants need to be upskilled to do it the vast majority of applications that, that i look at and rosie looks at are not fit for purpose they do not follow the protocols even set out within the the user guide for DEFA 3.1 metric you know so every time we go well how big is this habitat area you've not mapped it out what condition it is is it in you've not submitted photos or you've submitted photos that are taken in december what are your kind of fisc skill level are you qualified to actually undertake phase one habitat survey in the first place you know all of these kind of questions uh, are, are not being addressed so every london borough i think needs to have somebody in house and they need to have a vision of what their borough wants whether it's you know and, and it may be that that ultimately you know the public and the elected members don't want a nature rich borough and that's you know ultimately that's democracy what i'm trying to push in sutton with rosie and, and our councillors and elected members and our strategic management is to have a nature rich borough we want to be net zero we want to be a sustainable borough this has been our ambition for a long time so how do we get there and this is one mechanism it's a tool within a planning mechanism to deliver what we kind of want at a landscape scale just <laughs> right so so has that addressed your your question kieran or have yeah, just I, I think yeah, to summarize what you're saying is exactly what i kind of hoped you'd say that in-house skills need to be within the local authority and i don't think that can be left to just ecological consultants because at the end of the day then they're, they're not neutral when it comes to assessing an application they can give guidance and advice put forward a plan but it should be assessed by somebody in-house at the council that has the skills to do that and that isn't usually a planning officer um I think that does mean that something like biodiversity net gain poses a real risk considering how many London boroughs actually have an ecologist on board already. So that that worries me personally quite a lot. Right. Absolutely. I mean, we spoke to to Barnet today, um, you know, and, and they've just managed to kind of wangle two new. Well, I say two new. They've managed to wangle two ecologists because this is kind of coming down the horizon and and you know strategically as a borough they're kind of going well we've got all this green space where do we go with it and and so an argument has been made that they need ecologists to help them with this and so they've recruited two people and they've had a gap for what was it rosie 25 30 years something like that without actually having you know in in person uh, in-house expertise so I think that's going to be the most the, the rise and fall of this Karen is absolutely going to be as as you've highlighted if we don't have critical assessment critical evaluation it's not going to work it's just I, going to be a tick box exercise and that's my significant fear I think my second fear on top of that though is from my experience a lot of ecologists working for local authorities are quite often overruled as well so I think it's important that we don't just have ecologists, but that we have ecologists that are able, that are, that are given the freedom to do their job and are listened to. I think living in the urban centre of England, there's always a pressure for development to go ahead regardless. And that, that's certainly something from friends of mine that are ecologists that I've heard that sometimes it can be a case of banging your head against a wall even when there is an ecologist there because they could be overruled by planning authority but i won't take up any more time i'm sure we could talk about this all day um, yeah so, so I'll, I'll just i'll just say Karen, i mean obviously one of the things is that is that the planning process is supposed to be a democratic process mm -hmm. so i as an officer can make my recommendations to the case officer the case officer makes recommendations in terms of whether to approve or not that planning permission and that can then be overruled by the planning committee who are democratically active members which then could eventually go to appeal to somebody that is not democratically elected that makes a decision based on what I don't know. I'm not that experienced in terms of how planning inspectorates actually work and, and are related to go that. But ultimately, you know, we we as officers can only make recommendations. That's that's as far as we can go. And even if 
you know, I make recommendations or the planning team is behind me for recommendations. It can be overruled by elected members. And ultimately that sits with the public to go, do we value this or do we value potentially NIMBYs? I don't know. I mean, I'm, you know, the, 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 there's kind of cases to be made either way, I think. Yeah. I'm going to jump in with a question from Edward Milner next. Because um, Kieran, well, I... Kieran, Edward is, he, is here and he's put his yeah. video on. So he, if you want, do you, did you want to ask a question? It's interesting, uh, Edward. Do you want to ask in person? Yeah, OK, fine. Uh, I was just, um, I'm just concerned about um, the long term uh, aspects of this because uh, you know, Alec, um, ecology and biodiversity isn't static. And it seems to me that you need to also, to go with this, have a vision of what the borough is going to look like in 10 years time or 20 years time, when, for example, there's going to be more droughts, more hot weather in the summer, probably more storms, more uh, torrential rain, drainage and things. So. I'm very, very hesitant about the idea of trying to create new woodlands at the moment, um, because my experience of seeing uh, trees planted or woodlands created is that uh, even under the present circumstances, that doesn't seem to work very well. Uh, so I, I'm just concerned about looking at this in a, in a longer term basis. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a significant concern. Um, and ultimately, I don't have an answer because, you know, I don't know what is like, what is going to happen. We know that what we think is likely to happen, that we've moved towards, as you say, more Mediterranean climate. I mean, f for me, you know, it, can, it has to go back to kind of first principles so that we know that, that our native species post-glaciation have survived significant climatic upheavals, going through the lower dry ass into, you know, kind of warmer periods little ice ages all that kind of stuff and we know that they kind of operate in you know in plus or minus where they're going so we may have an increase in um small leaf lime we then have decrease in small leaf lime we have increases in, in witch elm decrease you know na nature as you say not static so i'm not sure how much we can kind of influence that all we can try and do is is for me make sure that the store that every habitat gets if we are creating it or if we're enhancing it is in line with with the information that we currently have as to what is likely to to influence those um species in terms of their horticology and, and their scenic as to how they interact lots of for instance i mean so you know a few years ago north of vegas southern beach was was kind of touted as as the you know kind of one of the save all species to, to deal with a more Mediterranean climate. And that's obviously now affected by Phytophthora's jumping genera between beech and oak and Nothophagus and stuff like that. So if we plant that, are we kind of setting it up to fail? And we don't know kind of where those aspects are. We're obviously seeing the impacts of um, uh, um, Aminocyphus, uh, Ash dieback coming through. There's Ash elminal borers. There's all these kind of pests, pests and pathogens sweeping through as well so anything that you plant may well be inf infected by these pests and pathogens as well as having to suffer the, the kind of impact of climate change as well so i think i think the sort of thing i was thinking was um that when you're planting uh you should bear in mind that the risks of both drought and flood i'm just a simple example the risks of drought and flood are increased um and, and, and stand as a much bigger risk in the future than they perhaps have been in the past. Even so, uh, many urban, certainly trees, in my experience, are under considerable stress as it is. The urban environment is not an environment they evolved to survive in. So they're already under stress. Yeah, I mean, and so, I mean, so, I mean, this means things like location, buffering, um, whether it's kind of planting within an existing woodland belt, you know species selection all all matter um obviously kind of planting care after care are, are, are hugely important in terms of how these things spend the first five to ten years of their life to actually develop good rootstock mycorrhizal uh, associations all those things that that all habitats need to evolve uh, to 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 flourish successfully the, there's some things that are, that are going to be outside of our control um, all we can try and do is is pick 
for Sutton, the right tree in the right place for the right reasons to deliver, we think is, is likely to be a robust solution in the long term. The, tr the trouble is that obviously woodlands and many of our habitats outlive by a long way the kind of bi bi uh, biodiversity net gain lifespan of 30 years. You know, ultimately in, in that time scale, what, if we, even if we create a, a really kind of good embryonic woodland, it's nowhere near a woodland. That woodland needs, you know, three, four, five, six hundred years or more to kind of get to where it should be with the correct management. So, yeah, I don't know. It, 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 it's, it's a short answer, but, but we will try to kind of make it as, as robust as possible. But it's Can certainly I, why I regard uh, preservation as more important than creation. But I think the, the question that was asked after me is also very relevant, and I think you ought to deal with that next. Yes, yeah, so um, Rebecca, do you want to ask your question in person? Oh, I'm happy to read it out if not. I'm, I'm sort of sort of halfway starting up a hill, so I'm a bit out of breath. Um, <laughs> can you hear me okay? Yeah, that's fine. I think it's possibly the question then about um, urban food production. Yeah. Um, and effectively, how does this, how is it affected by sort of the calculations, especially when some of the proposals thing up food forests often include non-natives. So I was just wondering about that. And also, I didn't add it in there, but also vertical surfaces, how do they kind of factor in? Yeah, um, excellent and, and complex questions, Rebecca, I'm afraid. So, so hopefully I won't go too long about them. In terms of vertical surfaces, so, you know, the, there are, so each of these has a habitat distinctiveness. Um, ultimately, all vertical surfaces are set as kind of low habitat distinctiveness um, because in the natural world, there aren't that many. And obviously in the UK, we don't have many. Uh, climbing species there's maybe you know, five or six um so to so generally we can say well it's fairly low because it's 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 a very very artificial habitat it has limited value because niche availability is much more restricted uh and species selection is, is also much more restricted so in terms of vertical surfaces whether it's ground up kind of trailing down facade bound i.e it's kind of modular system each is kind of considered rightly or wrongly in, in a kind of similar fashion in terms of um bng urban food production i mean it very much depends on on what your baseline value is if you have a, a car park on a block of flats that you're knocking down and restarting in terms of you know a, a kind of mixed use facility with you know a, a roof garden for instance then absolutely you can put in effectively an intensive roof, you can put in a garden, you can put in uh, growing walls, you can put in everything that you kind of want. And that is still likely to provide a biodiversity net gain. It's then just, does that fit with whatever the kind of boroughs or, or biodiversity strategy kind of wants to deliver? And it may be, and, and, and my biodiversity strategy currently is kind of very much, what do we really have? What do we really want to protect? What do we want to? um promote but urban food because we don't have much of an issue in terms of urban food growth but in the next 5 10 15 years that may become a much more uh, significant issue and in which case we'll need to kind of factor that in does that does that kind of make sense have i answered the question i'm not sure yep yeah rebecca's happy with that and uh just okay, linked thank you rebecca yeah, yeah it's got a thumbs up um and just linked to that um craig do you want to ask a bit more about allotments no, no. <laughs> no. okay so, so basically um he's made the comment that there's a lot about the value of allotment habitat and it kind of links in a bit i suppose to food production so is there a kind of view on allotments and what you know kind of how do they yeah i mean again allotments are within our bespoke metric and within the defra are generally kind of categorized as low distinctiveness habitats and this is because there can be so much variety between you know i mean however big a, an allotment plot is it's 90 square meters whatever it is 
you know, somebody can have such a, a really fantastic run and then next door, the, you know, path width away is absolutely pristine and slug controlled and, you know, all those kind of things that are, that are very detrimental to wildlife. So I think we have to take a, a kind of broad view as to, to how is that allotment in, in its entirety managed. And this is where the multiplier comes in that it can, if it's in good condition, because everybody's plot is kind of pulling in the same direction, then even though it may be a low distinctiveness habitat of two biodiversity units per hectare, if it's in good condition, it could then be six biodiversity units per hectare. Whereas if it's, you know, a kind of a bit hodgepodge, it could be four. And then if it's all very kind of pristine and very much focused on food ground, with no niche availability for the wildlife, it's two. So, so that kind of condition does allow an amount of gradation between even I mean, you know, and, and the same that happens, obviously, for gardens, you know, I garden for wildlife. So I would think that my garden is, is probably quite good condition, even though the habitat distinctiveness for, for my kind of borders is probably low. Because, and I've got non-natives in there to extend flowering season and all that kind of stuff. So, so that does allow an amount of flexibility, I guess. And I guess there's also the issue about like, non-natives can sometimes work quite well if you're looking, thinking about the, you know, insects and entomology rather than the, the botanical kind of, you know. Of, what, of course. I mean, you know, what, actually... yeah, I, mean, I mean, what we want. So in our condition, we specify that we want um, structural heterogeneity. We want kind of mature trees and scrub and, and, and to retain those as much as possible because of the mitigation hierarchy. And then if you're doing a landscaping scheme, we want to see kind of more mature trees. So maybe heavy standards, light feather standards, working down to understory scrub, and then some kind of buffer strip around hedgerow or whatever to create an ecotone, then into maybe a, a flowering lawn rather than just a perennial ryegrass lawn. So we want that kind of structure to come through. We want the species composition to reflect what is useful in in our local area so larval host plants berry production nut production um all those things that that we know that invertebrates need to go through their three or four life stages depending on on you know whether they're heterometabolites or, or whatever so so we could you know we can't legislate for every single species that's just never going to happen you know this is a hyper complex world we're trying to reduce this from being hyper complex to just being kind of super complex, I guess. Um, so, so everything that we're trying to do is trying to work on kind of ecological principles and it's never gonna work across the board. I mean, that just can't work, but we can go, we know in general, the larger an area, the better, the more species diversity, the better, the more structural diversity, the better. So that's what we try to, 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 um, to, to instill upon our landscaping schemes. Thanks. And um, there's, a, there's a couple of other things um, before we finish off. So, um, Alison, do you want to um, ask your questions in person? Yes, please. I was just going to ask, <laughs> you must feel that you've gone from ecologists to regulators. <laughs> so I, I was going to ask you how much is on your team? How much support do you actually get from the planners? And given that you've got, you must be having... 30-year uh, monitoring reports already coming in from the last couple of years, so years one and two. Who requests that? Who reads it? And how do you stop everyone jumping to offsets? Is that on you? Is that on the planners? Will they uh, monitor the Section 106 agreements? And how ultimately do you stop the drift of nature from the less wealthy areas to, to the wealthier areas? How how is this equitable? Right, loads in there, Alison. Um, so so I get I, so in terms of kind of um, so monitoring, yeah, we're just starting to kind of get the first couple come through. Um, it's taken a, a bit of a while for me to actually cut on that that we need as part of a section one six agreement. Whether you have a, a, a net loss or a, or a net gain, I mean, particularly if you have a net gain because it's in situ. That we actually need to charge a monitoring fee as well because somebody needs to read that report somebody needs to assess it or go on site so i mean ultimately our um, enforcement team is very supportive but they've got massive loads of, of cases to deal with anyway so uh, currently it kind of sits on us to, to kind of start 
chase it up where we think there's information that we need to um, kind of request. So uh, I think that was the kind of first one. Um, so you, you, how much do you charge just out of interest for a monitoring report? Um, I mean, that would be you rather than a planning officer. Well, I mean, so 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 if so, our kind of um, pre-application charges are are set currently. So if somebody wants pre-application biodiversity advice, it's fifty two pounds an hour. So effectively, what I put in the um, section one hundred six is that it's fifty two pounds an hour for however many hours it takes to deal with that. Now, whether that's I'm going out and surveying it, writing a report, which may be two or three days. If I'm glancing at one report, that may be a couple of hours, in which case that, that will be the kind of charge. Uh, and, and, that, and then we kind of effectively send an invoice to, uh, to the developer to say, this is how much, or the flip side may be that they pay a commuted sum and we kind of draw down from that. Um, so th th there's a variety of kind of mechanisms that we could uh, we, we could utilize for that. Um, but yeah, the, the first question is how it almost everything is on our team at the minute, which is why I do Rosie. Um, because otherwise I'm out of capacity, you know, I'm so out of capacity anyway. Um, but the kind of chasing up an enforcement is 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 difficult. Obviously, one of the things is the kind of time frames. Um, you know, we we started this in in 2018, kind of a little bit before as I kind of pushed it as we we had the draft local plan. Um, so we're just kind of starting to do kind of condition compliance assessments on some of those kind of 2016, 2017 schemes because we need to give them a chance to be up and running. Uh, and the kind of front loading the conditions probably didn't come in until maybe 2019, 2020, as I kind of saw where we, we had the gaps, which is what Rosie says, it's, it, it is an iterative process. I didn't have, you know, a full scheme birth from the lines of Gaia uh, as, as a fully fledged thing. It, it has to kind of um, work as, as I'm kind of learning through this and, and everybody else is kind of learning through this. Um, so where was your, what were your other kind of questions? Well, it was about equity. And yeah. Uh, <sighs> Alison, Christ, I mean. <laughs> um, It's it's incredibly difficult. I mean, so so in Sutton we have a, a, a very kind of marked socioeconomic climb from south to north. So we have a lot of large gardens, big houses in the south of the borough, particularly on the kind of chalk. In the north, kind of um, interwar housing, privet hedges, small garden spaces, not so much um, amenity uh, space, certainly within their kind of local area and areas of deficiency obviously kind of come into this in terms of access to nature. Ultimately, if there's nowhere I can put an offset within that area because to do so I'd need to knock down somebody's house, I can't deliver an offset. So it has to go where I'm constrained to actually be able to put it. And, and realistically within Sutton, that's towards the more kind of um, larger parks, and the green belt towards the south, which is the more kind of salubrious uh, areas. How I how I kind of reverse that, I'm open to ideas. So just to come in on that though, David, does that mean that biodiversity net gain is a potential problem down the line? Because if all the offsetting is going to the great green spaces that you've already got and the wealthy areas, over time, surely you're going to run out of they're going to have all been dealt with we can't we can't move everything to the the best places so, yeah i mean and to to to, to i mean it, it, it's not on, on on the presentation but ultimately we have a kind of map of the borough and, and this is at this stage just kind of doodling so it will become more formalized through our kind of local nature recovery strategy which then feeds into london's local nature recovery strategy and thinks about kind of cross-border um aspects so so there are places within the kind of more interwar housing areas to the north that are currently fairly large uh, amenity grassland spaces. 
So where whenever there's kind of a grassland, a mean to grassland space, I've started to kind of draw in potentially we can have a meadow here, or we can have a woodland or a copse or something. Because we need we can't just go right, well, everything's concentrated in the green belt, because that is not a nature rich or resilient borough. We need to have it interspersed throughout. So in terms of having it in situ uh, for, for developments and then wherever we kind of uh, have the opportunity to create something ecologically better as, as an offset, we will aim to do that. And that's that's spread across the borough. But obviously there's significant constraints throughout the borough because there's so much great infrastructure. So effectively, we will do what we can, but we can't create a, a, a fully equitable world because that just can't exist with the current layout of the land. Um, so what's your second point, Karen? Sorry. Sorry. I was thinking there's probably a, a role for giggle here with um, the areas of deficiency as well, especially in those boroughs that haven't got ecology officers. Or yeah, I mean, so, so we're talking capacity. to giggle, we're doing a pilot study uh, or, or a trial with them to look at kind of confidence in mapping. Um, so this is particularly for kind of South Sutton and Central Sutton, which are kind of more urban areas. We'll then kind of do some ground truthing. We'll then hopefully roll it out to the whole borough and then that will hopefully give giggle confidence to say to other london boroughs we've trialed this in sutton it's been ground truths we know how kind of much uh, accuracy and veracity we put to our kind of mapping depending on whatever inputs come into it and that therefore in kingston or barnet or hounslow or wherever this is what we think you kind of have so so that's what we're kind of doing we're also looking at whether there's um, aspects of, you know, uh, kind of satellite imagery, drones, fixed wing aeroplanes, artificial intelligence can actually do some of this kind of monitoring for us. But, you know, we, we know where the areas of deficiency are, they're in our local plan. How we address those, if we don't knock down swathes of houses and create new green space, is incredibly difficult. Everything is just going to have more and more pressure. And we need to take that into account in the metric as well. So are there indirect impacts because you're intensive, uh, intensifying urbanisation near one of our sites? So... It is, it's, I mean, that is, a, it is certainly the kind of equity aspect of it is very complex, but I'm also thinking about the role of, you know, education. So in terms of people's, you know, kind of use of gardens and the sort of small it's not going to be maybe as high quality, but those smaller habitats, little pocket parks, it's like what you do with those and the gardens, you know, kind of in a collective sense, maybe about helping kind of educate people about ways of managing those so that you are kind of putting things into, into those, perhaps, you know, on the outside, they don't look particularly great habitats, but that, you, you know, that still makes a difference. And it makes a difference very close to where the majority of the people are. So I think that's kind of like a really important aspect. Yeah, I mean, I mean, well. absolutely. I mean, our kind of, so we we facilitate um, Sutton Nature Conservation Volunteers, and their kind of strapline is nature on your doorstep. So we mm -hmm. want people to kind of start looking down and going, we don't need to look at David Attenborough programs and go, oh, you know, isn't it terrible? We've got loads of good stuff. You just need to have yeah. a look, a bit of a closer look. Yeah. I mean, where well, we can influence this, certainly, you know, I mean, so sometimes in, in pocket parks, if we have the, the funding to actually do something useful and put in interpretation boards, we will do so. If it's a private development, um, you know, I, I the kind of developer does it and then the freeholds are, sell, are sold off. What we, so, so we, can, we can say, ultimately, we want you to do this to deliver a net gain. The landowner can then do what they like. They can strip it out. They can put Astro Turf on. They can, you know, they can make it as horrible as they wish. And we can't do anything about that. What we do do is, in, in many of these cases where we think there's likely to be a kind of transition from a management company to private ownership, is that effectively we, we kind of have a, a biodiversity white goods book. So we say, if you're doing something to say, well, you need to do stuff about, you know, your kind of water consumption. So here's information about your water consumption. And we've put in, you know, low flush or dual flush systems and you can only use this and here's a smart water meter. Or we've put in a triple plus white goods because 
you know, those those help our kind of carbon capture, carbon offsetting figures. And so we say, well, create a create a little book, create a little book to say why we've created the landscaping that we have, how you can deliver it, how you can go better. You you can do all these kind of things. So thinking about, you know, uh, making a smooth curve for pollen and nectar availability from spring through summer, main, utilizing mainly natives, and then some supplementary kind of southern hemisphere species to give that extra kind of um, aspects. So, so I, that's kind of how we're trying to trying to deal with that. Sorry, Rosie. Yeah, no, that's fine. Sorry, I didn't want to um, jump in. I just wanted to also say as well um, that, um, you know, I think biodiversity, you know, again, that there's a role, and I guess this is the opportunity with, with joining David, is that um, it, it's also about, um, you know, d talking to our other departments within the local authority and helping them out. And trying to kind of get that idea of biodiversity net gain higher up, and 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 working with with people in different parts of the borough, which are quite concrete and are grey and need a lot of help, and and, and are in those areas of deficiency. Um, so, for example, we're working with colleagues at um, a, a regeneration site um, that um, you know currently is just you know your classic amenity grassland, but there's a huge potential to deliver gain biodiversity net gain there so we you know we're involved as part of the biodiversity team to to um, do events and to engage the, the local people to tell them about you know what potential there can be in 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 their area but also what potential positive there could be you know so it is about delivering gains you know um, outside of the offsetting and, and the yeah. habitat banking yeah. but actually that, that, that can do a lot of good um, and we're also working with them um, uh, the Institute of Cancer Research and, and that area, you know, that's a huge, uh, you know, internationally important centre for well-being, and it's in Sutton. And that, I feel, is a huge potential. You know, there's a lot of new residents going in, but there's a whole lot of innovation and research. You know, we could do some, do some amazing things there, and, it, and I think it has to be ecologically relevant and also people focused, mm. you know, so there's, you know, there's some really nice things that we are trying to explore with the people there to sort of think about, you know, landscape scale, strategic ecological enhancement on, you know, some of the most greyest parts of the borough. Mm. So, you know, that's a different angle. It's, yeah. You know, yeah. But that, yeah. that's kind of looking at it from different scales. Mm. Thank, yeah, thank you. That's really kind of uh, really interesting. I'm glad you kind of brought that in as well. I'm really conscious that we're going to need to wrap this up. It's a really interesting conversation. It's the sort of conversation we could kind of carry on all evening. But I'm conscious some people need to head off. I know Giuseppe put, popped in a question about how a young ecologist might find out more about um, BNG. And uh, you've kind of put some suggestions. So if you want to maybe send me, if, if Giuseppe wants to contact us or possibly contact you directly, then you know you've obviously got some things that you can share, and I think some other people pop some helpful sort of suggestions on there as well. Um, Sylvia, you've got your hand up, so I'm going to just finish off with you, and then we're going to say um, kind of sort of wrap things up. But did you have something you wanted to pop in at the end? It was a quick. Well, it's not going to be a quick question, so I don't know. It might just be something that I'll put out there, and it could be answered later. But okay. what about biodiversity covenants, though? Because when the Environment Act becomes properly enforceable law even if a developer sells on that land, that dirty, my understanding is that 30 year management agreement sh has to then be passed on to the new owner because otherwise it becomes meaningless. So how would that then be enforced when a new owner takes possession and they may not know that there is a, a management plan in place for habitat that's been put in as biodiversity net gain? I mean, do councils have a plan on how to enforce that message would it be like conservation areas sorry i'll just throw that really no I, so, so i think i think very quickly i mean what we what we are likely to see is that certainly for for the kind of small scale losses that we are likely to suffer in sutton because we have stringent you know mitigation hierarchy so if you want to to build on one of our sinks for instance it was going to cost you an extraordinary amount of money to do so and it will almost certainly make the project unviable. So that's an, an extra kind of layer for me of protection to go, right, okay, you want to do this, I'm going to charge you £6.7 million pounds to do it. All right, we'll just think about something else. So we're going to go back to the mitigation hierarchy and, and, and think about an alternative site. So, so for me, part of it is to kind of disincentivize the stuff that we don't want. Um, in terms of covenants, <sighs> 
you know, we'll we'll have to see what what the Town and Country Planning Act, as it's kind of updated, will will have to say on this. Um, I think it's likely for us, certainly in the very short term, that we will probably not push that too hard, because it then becomes, in my opinion, at the minute, unduly onerous on small developments. You know, if somebody wants to kind of partition off their land and, and put one house on for, you know, like a granny flat or something, to have, you know, effectively our conditions are, are nearly kind of three pages just for a small kind of biodiversity in that game with the biodiversity enhancement management plan, a CAMP construction uh, enhancement management plan, features for wildlife and a statement of conformity. Is that then proportionate to that development? Or do we just go, we'll let you kind of buy a tiny fragment of a biodiversity unit from something that we've created elsewhere, which is more proportionate. Now, there's an argument that that is, you know, it is again kind of issuing death by a thousand cuts. But if we don't sell off that, we can't create more, bigger, better, better connected elsewhere. And that, that's the, the kind of moral dilemma that I have. I don't want to lose any habitat. I don't want to lose any wildlife. But if we're going to achieve the aims of, of having a nature-rich and resilient borough, I've got to accept losses somewhere. And so it's, it's accepting the losses that I think are the least important. And that may mean that bits of back garden land go. That seems a bit of a sober kind of ending, but I think we're going to have to leave it there. Um, and it just, you know, just kind of interesting all the kind of issues these this raises. But it's just been really fascinating to kind of learn more about, um, you know, Sutton's approach, the kind, all the kind of thinking, and you know, the way that that's developed, and also th sort of thinking about how you see the future developing. So I want to thank both you, David, and you, Rosie, so much for a really fascinating evening. 